Every day in Iowa City, I see people in passing, and I think to myself, I wonder who that person is. Did he grow up here? Or did he come for college and end up staying because he got a grant for his research? Or maybe the love of his life? He's a townie. He decided. decided to raise their kids here. In Iowa City, today I see people I see people every day. And wonder, what's her story? And wonder, or what she does for a living. I see her around. And walking her dog. Maybe she's the writer of that, of that book I loved so much. Maybe she's a dancer. A chef. Iowa City is interesting like that. The guy sitting next to you on the bus could be your new favorite singer. That lady who helped held the door open for you could be a filmmaker. A politician. I see people. I see people every day and wonder. And what's wonder. What's your story? 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 In 2000, when Terry Walls was diagnosed with relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis or MS, her decline was swift. In only three years' time, Terry found herself in a reclining wheelchair. As an academic internal medicine physician at the University of Iowa, Dr. Terry Walls started studying the medical literature and designed a new intervention, which she tested upon herself. It worked, and by 2008, Terry was riding a bike and preaching the power of intensive nutrition. This is her story. Well, Terry, thank you for mm -hmm. sitting down with me. So in 2000, you had a, an MS diagnosis. Correct. What was your life like? What was your health like right so, before that diagnosis? Um, at that time, I was moving from my practice in Wisconsin to the University of Iowa and the Iowa City VA. Um, I uh, could still walk. I could jog short distances. But I had noticed if I uh, walked more than half an hour, I began uh, to stumble. And I was having difficulty picking up the toes of my left foot. Uh, I had ignored that for several months, but at the uh, uh, wishes of my family, I finally went in to see my physician, uh, and they saw that I had what's called a foot drop. Um, and I uh, was sent over to neurology, had MRI of the spine, uh, a lot of tests, some of which actually hurt quite a bit, uh, evoked sensory potentials, um, uh, visual potentials, spinal tap. Uh, and I had what's called oligobands in the spinal fluid, which meant I had multiple sclerosis. Uh, at that time, my physician uh, said that I should consider taking uh, one of the injections, either an interferon or a copolymer one, uh, so that I could increase the likelihood that within 10 years, I'd still be walking, working, doing life pretty much as I'd known it. So you thought you had about 10 years before? I'd get into trouble. Get into trouble, trouble. okay. Um, and so I started the injections because I wanted to maintain life as normally as I could. Uh, and I, I came here to Iowa City um, and was still walking, working. I uh, really told no one about my diagnosis. Um, and I did really quite well. I had only one transient weakness uh, or uh, acute worsening that's called a relapse where my right arm was weak for about a week. Um, but by the end of 2003, I had gotten steadily um, more fatigued. I, I had more weakness in my back muscles. And in 2004, I needed, uh, in very short order, a cane, scooter, and a tilt recline wheelchair. And that was because my back was so weak, I couldn't sit up in a chair very easily anymore. Wow. So what did, what did the MS feel like when it first started pushing you into that chair? Is it, is uh, it fatigue. fatigue? Fatigue was the biggest problem. OK. Um, I also uh, have some intermittent episodes of facial pain, where I have sh uh, sharp electrical pains that will start either on my right side or on my left side, spread across my face. Yeah, it's sort of like having a cattle prod zap you uh, oh. for just a moment. Uh, it's very unpleasant. Uh, and these episodes of pain will come randomly, last about a week to two weeks, and then go away. Very difficult to treat. So in short order, in, in, you said in three years time? So in three years, I went from walking, nothing visible, to uh, needing a tilt recline wheelchair. Wow, and your prognosis had been more you know, in the 10 year ballpark, so that must have been pretty shocking. Um, yeah, it was uh, very shocking. And you know that was actually the, um, when I first went back to reading the medical literature. You know, being a physician, uh, when I was first diagnosed, I logged on and started reading the medical literature myself, uh, wanting to educate myself about MS. Uh, and what I read at that time was, uh, it's a progressive disease that most people uh, within 10 to 15 years will convert to secondary progressive MS, 
and that's when your disease gets slowly, steadily worse. Treatments are relatively ineffective. Um, and that within 10 years, half of people uh, can't work because of fatigue, a third to half have difficulty uh, walking. Uh, and so, you know, that had made me so upset, so agitated. I'd, finally, my uh, family had said, Terry, you gotta quit reading, you're just getting yourself crazy. So from 2000 to 2004, I really read no more literature. I just did whatever my doctor said right. and left it at that. Took the medicine. Took the medicine. Exercised. The as, and you know, like I, I um, ran as long as I could. When I couldn't ran, run anymore, then I walked on a treadmill. I lifted weights. I put a endless pool in my house, and I swam every morning. Um, so I, I was doing everything that I could. But when I hit the wheelchair, I knew how bad this was going to be. Um, and that's when I decided to go back to start reading the medical literature myself. Where was your head at this point? Was your, were your thoughts foggy? I mean, you're encountering all this big medical so, literature and trying to comprehend oh, it, yeah. in so, addition to this emotional strife that's going on. Um, in, when I was first diagnosed in 2000, my docs said uh, cognitive problems, that is thinking problems, are really not a problem uh, with MS. Hmm. But over the next few years, physicians uh, rethought that and uh, recognized that as the MS progresses, thinking speed, thinking ability will slowly decline. And did you notice that in yourself too? Um, not yet in 2003 mm. uh, or four, but by 2007, yes. Uh, by then I was losing my keys, losing my phone. I was having to keep a very detailed planner to keep track of everything that I needed to do. So it would eventually catch up with me. But when I first started reading the literature in 2004, you know, I, I may be an internal medicine doc, but you know, um, the half-life of new medical knowledge is about every five years it turns over. So a lot of the stuff I was reading about with multiple sclerosis uh, and brain biology, you know, had not been discussed when I was in medical school. So I had new words, new terms, new concepts uh, to learn. So I'd be looking at an article, reading it, looking it up, trying to make sense of it, and it was very slow going. On the other hand, um, I, I did finally you know, reach some conclusions that uh, there wasn't a good explanation for what was causing the secondary progressive slow deterioration MS. So I started uh, looking for articles about other brain problems where the brains shrank and people got demented. So I started reading about Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, Huntington's disease. And in all of those diseases, the mitochondria uh, were not working quite properly. Now, the mitochondria. Oh yes, the mitochondria. <laughs> so let me explain mitochondria. Mitochondria are the reason you and I are larger than bacteria. The mitochondria is a subportion within uh, each cell that helps convert the food energy into uh, a different kind called um, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, that your cell will use to drive the biochemistry of life. And our brains are packed, just completely packed with mitochondria. Mitochondria uh, helps the brain cell function really well. Uh, and if your mitochondria is not quite up to par, the brain cell is gonna have more and more difficulty doing its job. Plus, it's more likely to tell the brain cell sorry, time to die, and have the brain cell die a bit too early, hence causing the shrink. So in 2005, I uh, then had this sort of brilliant idea of, well, I I'd started doing searches for what were the drugs that would help mitochondria. And well, that didn't get me anywhere. Uh, and then uh, a brilliant stroke was, well, what about vitamins and supplements? And now I only had about 24 articles to read, six of which were in English. So I you know, ordered those six from the Hardin Medical Library, read them, and identified the first few uh, vitamins and supplements that I would take to support my mitochondria. With the caveat being, these were all studies in mice using things like lipoic like acid, carnitine, creatine, coenzyme Q. So essentially, at this point, you're experimenting on yourself. Well, that's what I was getting ready to do uh, because I thought, well, you know, these don't look too toxic. They're vitamins, amino acids. I wanted to try them. Um, but I was on a long list of multiple sclerosis drugs, so I uh, saw my primary care doc, mm -hmm. who uh, looked over the articles um, and agreed to check 
you know, uh, compound by compound against my drug list and said, okay, they're, they're okay. Uh, and I had to translate now these mouse sized doses into human sized doses. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I started uh, uh, coenzyme Q, uh, B vitamins, creatine, carnitine. Uh, and you know, after three, four months, I thought, you know, I'm no better. I'm just as exhausted, just as fatigued. And so I quit. And I couldn't get out of bed. I was exhausted. So Ooh. after a couple days, I started up my supplements again. And I was um, able to get up and go to work. So I thought, hmm. So, so there was something to it. Maybe there's something to <laughs> it. A couple weeks later, I repeated it again with the same kind of result. So my conclusion was uh, the vitamins and supplements were very helpful. Uh, and while they weren't returning me to good health, likely they were slowing down the slope of my decline. And so uh, I was very hopeful. And also uh, these small successes got me to be more confident, more willing to spend a little time uh, every week, reading through uh, the medical literature, searching on PubMed uh, for what was going on uh, uh, in multiple sclerosis and brain disorders. But now I was looking for vitamins supplement studies as opposed to the latest drugs and working on slowly improving my understanding of uh, brain biology. Now, would you say MS drugs are treating the symptoms of MS, but they're not treating the cause of MS? So let me step back for a moment. So what causes MS? Um, it's the body uh, beginning to attack uh, some of the brain structures, the insulation around the wiring in the brain, uh, and that slowly causes damages, breaks, and gaps. So that uh, from my the cortex, from my brain, the messages out down to my leg become uh, less reliable or the sensory messages up to my brain become less reliable. I'm more likely to have problems either with vision or balance or severe pain uh, or motor problems with uh, coordination and strength. So uh, the, most of the drugs, either in the interferon, uh, the copolymer one, or some of these new very, very high cost drugs like Tizabri, all block some f uh, part of my immune system. So I can't mount as much of an attack against my own brain. It also means I can't mount as much of an attack against foreign invading uh, germs Old and organisms. Okay. And it will also mean that globally I won't feel as well taking these MS drugs because they're interfering with my biology to some degree. Uh, now there's another uh, interesting uh, uh, observation about MS. We know that it's a, uh, many different genes contribute to the risk, but um, the genetic risk is maybe five to at most 30% of the risk. The 70 to 95% is from unknown environmental factors. Mm. And I'd ask my neurologist, you know, many different people in my primary care doc, so what are those environmental factors? And they'd say, well, you know, we don't know. Mm. Um, now, the summer of, of uh, 05, you know, I could still walk short distances. Uh, I needed a zero-grav chair uh, to work so I could recline. That's uh, based on the uh, NASA chairs where you could recline back. Your knees are up at the, the level of your heart, and there's a lot of dump that holds you in the chair. So that allowed me to continue to work. The university and the VA redesigned my job uh, so that I was on the Institutional Review Board which meant I was reviewing now 30 scientific studies every month and reading more science. And uh, that was um, a lot to learn how to do. But it got me reading more science and more uh, biology. Over um, 5, uh, 06, 07, I was continuing my very slow, gradual decline. Um, I were still continuing with the supplements at this point. I was still taking the supplements. I'd added uh, a few more uh, over the years. Um, I, I would also uh, should note that uh, in 2003, uh, one of my neurologists had suggested I check out uh, Ashton Embry's work. And he was a big advocate of a paleolithic diet. So I had been uh, following a uh, gluten-free, uh, dairy-free, and legume-free eating pattern uh, pretty much since uh, 03. 
but had felt like, well, you know, I, I still had gone downhill. So, well, uh, from 2000 to 2005, I'd gone downhill very rapidly. And then when I started my supplements, I slowed down, but I was still gradually getting worse. Um, the University of VA had redesigned my job multiple times so I could keep working. Um, I was reviewing a lot more scientific uh, articles, uh, part of the IRB. By the summer of 07, uh, mental fog was getting to be a bigger problem. I was losing my keys. I was losing my phone. I had to replace my phone, I think, uh, three times. I had a notebook where I kept track of all of my daily activities. Uh, life, it, it was difficult. It was really hard to read through all those scientific studies. And on a personal level, you were, you were attempting to heal yourself. You were experimenting on yourself. Oh, absolutely. And you were, you were seeing the slowdown, but you weren't seeing the, the result that you ultimately wanted, which is recovery. recovery. Well, so how did you keep going at that point? Well, one of the things uh, that you have to do is come to terms with uh, acceptance. So I'd accepted I wasn't going to be walking much again, uh, that I wouldn't be biking or having an active life. Um, I wanted to try and slow things down a little bit further as best I could. Uh, my uh, uh, partner uh, and I were talking about the fact we'd probably have to bring the scooter into my house the next year because even walking very short distances has, was becoming so extremely difficult. Um, and because sitting, uh, sitting like this would have exhausted me. Uh, I couldn't sit in a standard chair anymore more than five or 10 minutes. Uh, and so I knew the future I was facing was becoming bedridden for my disease. Um, that's what kept you going, was I don't want to be bedridden. Well, I, I was the main breadwinner for my family. So you know, I wanted to keep working as long as I could. But I also knew that was going to be uh, coming to an end. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I could walk 10, 20 feet, two canes. Uh, at the end of the day, I'd get home. I would shuffle uh, to the bedroom, change, come out, hang out in the zero gravity chair, have dinner uh, when we'd eat. I was eating almost horizontal because I couldn't sit up anymore, and then I'd go to bed. That, that's what my life was like. One of the turning points for you was this introduction of this paleolithic diet. So what were you eating before this? Just You said so, you were eating gluten-free and dairy-free and, and legume-free. So, so I was eating gluten-free, dairy-free, uh, but I was still having uh, uh, potatoes, squash. Uh, I, I liked a lot of eggs. I would have uh, uh, meat. Uh, I would occasionally. Um, have dairy or gluten. Um, so I had over time become less meticulous. But I was, I was still probably having a lot of uh, carbs. I was not uh, particularly focused on what, how did I organize my day to see to what I had all the nutrients that I necessarily needed. So I was following a paleo diet, sort of, but without a lot of structure. During the summer of 07, uh, I think several important things happened. One, I... Well, let's first, let's explain what the paleo diet oh, is. Oh, yes, the paleo diet. <laughs> so um, the theory is, well, I'll come back, look at it two ways. The hunter-gatherers uh, around the world, people who are still living and existing by hunting and foraging for their foods. Um, and if you look at uh, the Inuit in Alaska, the uh, Amazonian uh, rainforest warriors, uh, the Aborigines, the Africans, you'll see that humans can eat a wide variety of different things. Uh, but locally, it's going to be green leaves, roots, uh, and whatever uh, fish, meat, uh, or fowl that you can capture, eggs in the spring. But there's no uh, dairy, no grain, no legumes. And uh, the theory is that over two million years, the evolution of our species ate green leaves, roots, fruits, meat. Occasionally, we had eggs. About 10,000 years ago, humans began having uh, grains. Uh, 8,000 years ago, we began having dairy and legumes. Now, that's a very short window of time period. Our genes are not um, as well equipped for handling these new foods. So the Paleolithic diet is trying to ask the question, if I was a hunter-gatherer, 
could I get this food and eat it? If I was uh, here 50,000 years ago before we started having agricultural practices, could I capture this food and eat it? Uh, and if the answer is, yep, you, you could have, then it would meet the Paleolithic standard. If the reality is, uh, nope, you, we, we couldn't have eaten uh, grass seeds because we weren't capable of grinding them, uh, then that would not be part of the paleo diet. So when you look at the scope of American health uh, in this country, um, and it's pretty well agreed upon that the reason that there's so much obesity and diabetes mm -hmm. and, and so many other problems is because of how we're eating. Oh, absolutely. Hamburgers, white potatoes, bread. So our, our, our diet has shifted from uh, a lot of greens, high protein, to a lot of carbohydrates, uh, grains, white flour, sugars, high fructose corn syrup. Mm -hmm. uh, that shifts the bacteria that live in your gut uh, in addition. Uh, it, and we know that when you have a high carb diet, you're much more likely to have diabetes, heart disease, um, mental health problems, autoimmune problems. It's tied into the uh, foods that we're eating uh, in these shifts that our DNA is not well equipped to handle. So for you, knowing what you knew, knew about uh, the, our genetic predisposition for a paleolithic diet, that we're, that we're going to be more well Correct. if we eat this way, did you jump right in and say, all right, I'm going to try this? So, you know, in 2003, I did the paleo diet. Um, what I didn't do in 2003, uh, 05, 06, was uh, understand as well as I could have what my brain specifically needed. Mm. And so during the summer of 07, um, I um, discovered the Institute of Functional Medicine. I uh, learned a few more brain nutrients. Uh, but most importantly, I sat down and said, okay, so my long list of brain nutrients, where are they in the food supply? Uh, so I turned to my medical science literature. They didn't have much. I turned to the food science literature. Uh, it was hard to find anything. Uh, and the two, my two best resources were uh, uh, The World's Healthiest Foods by George Mattelgeon and Google Wikipedia. <laughs> uh, and so I uh, recreated my diet now uh, to make sure that I had uh, plenty of uh, carnitine, creatine, alpha lipoic acid, uh, lots of sulfur amino acids, lots of uh, flavonoids. And how that diet looks is lots of greens. I would have um, oh, a plate full of greens for breakfast, a plate full for lunch, and two platefuls for supper. I'd have bright colors like carrots, beets, uh, omega-3 rich food like um, uh, walnuts, flax, uh, mackerel, salmon, herring grass-fed meats, et cetera. And when I recreated uh, my Paleolithic diet now in the context of stressing greens, sulfur-rich vegetables, colors, uh, and grass-fed wild meats, it was stunning. Um, so what happened to you? Well, uh, I need to add one more piece to that, sure. and that is uh, neuromuscular electrical stim. I have the device in my pocket, because I stim all of the time, actually. Okay. This is, a, so, is this a TENS unit? This is very, very similar to a TENS okay. unit. Uh, the frequency is a little bit different, and the electrodes are placed over muscle groups so that uh, you supply a electrical current through the battery to the muscles that will induce contraction. Okay. Uh, and it makes it easier for me to grow more muscle, grow more strength. And you're, so are you essentially you're exercising the muscle by stimulating Correct. it? Correct. Okay. Correct. Uh, so you get some... Uh, current through the device. Uh, while the device sends me shock, uh, I would also contract my muscle as well on top of the contraction driven by the device. So I, I'm having, you might think of it as electrically supported exercise. And at the point that I started this, I was so weak that my exercise was laying there with my electrodes on my belly, sucking in my gut for 10 seconds while the, I was being zapped and then waiting 10 seconds for a rest, and then sucking in another 10 seconds. Uh, and that's where I started my exercise program with. Um, so I started that in November. I started my intensive nutrition program where I had now designed my diet using Paleolithic principles, making sure I was eating the nutrients that I identified important to brain health. So a lot of greens, a lot of sulfur, a lot of color. Uh, in November, not much change with my walking. 
in December, again, not a lot of difference, but what was remarkable was that by the end of December, I could sit in a chair again. Wow. That was the first time in years. Um, and I had a uh, Christmas dinner at the table in an ordinary chair. Uh, then in January, you know, I'm, I'm taking my scooter to clinic and driving my scooter back and forth between exam rooms. Um, in the middle of January, I took my cane with me and I walked between exam rooms. That was the first time I'd done that in. That's very fast. Uh, a long time. Huh. The end of February, I walked in the hallway for the first time in years. And, you know, I remember uh, some of my physician colleagues coming up to me saying, like, oh my God, Dr. Walls, you're, you're walking. Because <laughs> um, it was only just a few years earlier that I'd seen Dr. Walls, what happened to you when they saw me in the wheelchair for the first time? So uh, by the end of February, I could uh, walk to clinic in between exam rooms. I did not need a cane and I had quit using uh, even my ankle brace. Uh, in March, you know, every two years I'd have a two-year review with the chair of medicine. You know, and I hadn't been on my scooter in a while. Uh, if, you, if you remember from the uh, VA, uh, you go down a hill, up a hill, over to the University Hospitals and Department of Medicine is in there. So it's probably about a, oh, a third of a mile walk and maybe a half mile. And I thought, you know, that's too far. So I'll take my scooter. So I got in my scooter and I drove over. I was going downhill, going uphill. So I was, <laughs> lost power. It, so I got off and I walked next to it, got a few more feet. I was like, well, this is a problem. I don't want to be late uh, to meeting uh, the chair of medicine. Um, but nobody was coming, so I uh, disengaged the uh, and pushed my scooter up the hill. Um, when I got to level ground, it was a whole lot easier. I left it by the old radiation oncology entrance. Uh, one of the uh, staff members there offered to call the patient mobile so I could uh, get a ride up to the uh, chair's office. And I said, well, how long would that take? So, oh, about you know, 15 minutes, half an hour. It's like, well, man, I'm already late. I can no. walk there fast. So <laughs> I walked. You know, I get there, and uh, Dr. Rothman, who was the chair of medicine at that time, his secretary says, you know, Dr. Walls, you're late. Shoes me in. So I uh, go in to see Dr. Rothman. I'm very apologetic, tell him that my uh, scooter died on the way over. He goes, oh, oh, so you had to wait for the patient mobile to come get you. I said, well, no, actually, I uh, pushed it up the hill and walked over. Now, Dr. Rothman hadn't seen me in about nine months. I looked really bad then. He's like, oh, my God. Well, Terry, so you must be on one of those new drugs, that Tizabri, that's released again. I said, well, no, actually, I've stopped my MS drugs. I'm uh, doing this through intensive nutrition and electrical stimulation. So uh, we <laughs> talked at length about that, and his, his uh, response was that uh, this was really quite remarkable. Uh, he wanted me to try and work with my uh, uh, treating physicians to get a case report written. Uh, because this was such a uh, unusual thing. Because once you get secondary progressive MS, the best you hope for is flat. Mm -hmm. You never, no one ever expects to have any kind of recovery. And of course, I was, had uh, a remarkable level of recovery. And uh, so that's about, oh, four or five months into my recovery. At six months, I got on my bike and biked around the block. My kids were terrified I was going to fall down. That was sort of funny. But I survived. Uh, then at nine months, my family had seen that the Courage Ride uh, had an 18-mile loop. And so we signed up as a family. And I thought, you know, 18 miles, that's pretty long. I don't think I can do 18 miles, but however long I can do will feel quite triumphant. So I uh, got my bike, and we had plenty of little snacks. I had to walk up uh, one hill at five miles. And had to lay down for a few minutes then. But we biked another five miles, laid down for a few minutes. So I had uh, a couple of rests. But I made it the whole way in three and a half hours. And I was tired, but ecstatic. Because I had totally accepted that with secondary progressive MS, those things would never happen again. 
Uh, then the following uh, year, uh, I began teaching the community uh, the benefit of using intensive nutrition to restore health. Uh, in 2009, I w went up to Canada. I gave a lecture up there. And while I was there, I went to uh, the Banff of the Canadian Rockies and did a trail ride in the Canadian Rockies. Uh, and then uh, the following year, in 2010, uh, I did uh, more lecturing around the country uh, here uh, uh, in Iowa City, in the regional. I uh, wrote a book, um, uh, again, promoting the use of intensive nutrition to restore health and, and putting out the message that most of our chronic diseases, diabetes, heart disease, mental health problems, autoimmune problems, can be dramatically improved by addressing those environmental factors. The biggest one of which is crappy nutrition, too many carbs, not enough greens, colors, sulfur, um, getting rid of the toxic load uh, that we have, and then uh, thinking about how we balance our stress hormones, uh, such things as meditative practices. Mm. By addressing those three big concepts, uh, people can have dramatic improvement in nearly any chronic disease that they have. Wow. So here you are, you're experiencing this slow recovery and then this really dramatic recovery when you change your diet. Yes, yes. At what point did you allow yourself to feel hopeful that this was going to stick? You know, uh, it's really pretty amazing. So I, we start, it's hard to walk even uh, a few feet with two canes. I, I did not contemplate that uh, recovery was possible until after I had already pushed my scooter up the hill to see uh, Dr. Rothman. I, I, I think, you know, uh, uh, Kubler-Ross's On Death and Dying talks about uh, the stages of grief that we go through when faced with uh, terminal illness or uh, a devastating illness of any type. You know, there's anger, denial, bargaining, um, and finally, one comes to acceptance. And that's an important part of dealing with uh, any devastating illness is uh, acceptance with your reality. So I had accepted that, that was my reality. I had, therefore, it takes an enormous risk to walk away from that acceptance and consider the possibility that things might change. And so I had to see tremendous levels of change uh, and push my scooter up the hill before I began to think, you know, I wonder how well I could become. Could I run again? Could I someday bike or, or do Taekwondo again? Um, and I, I, I think it's normal for someone who's had to have um, that level of acceptance for the change in their life to not uh, like, uh, begin to think about recovery quickly or easily. Mm -hmm. Because it took a long time, a lot of grieving, to get yourself to acceptance. Now, you, you, you talked a little bit about how you see this Paleolithic diet, um, the management of stress, um, positively affecting lots of chronic illnesses. Yes, yes. So someone who's relatively healthy, if they were to adopt some of these, these practices mm -hmm. in their life. What yeah. would they expect? What would they expect? So, um, well, there's a couple things. Uh, so in my primary care practice, um, I use these concepts with people with chronic disease. I have a clinical trial going on where we're using these concepts uh, in others with secondary progressive MS. All of my research ass assistants, and I have several students who are helping me out on this project, are college students in their 20s, in the prime of life, young, healthy, vigorous uh, ladies and men. Uh, and if they're going to work with me, I tell them, you have to follow the walls, the steady diet, for at least two weeks. And you have to follow, uh, use our daily logs, uh, so you know how challenging it is, and you experience the changes that happen. So all of these kids who feel great, feel like a million bucks, discover that when they follow the Walls diet, now they really do feel like a million bucks. Mm -hmm. And that before, um, they didn't have nearly the amount of energy or men mental clarity that they can experience when they go on uh, the Walls diet. Wow, and it seems that the shift that you almost have to adopt in order to take this diet on is to say, 
I'm not feeding my, I'm, I'm feeding my stomach, you know, ultimately, right? But yes. I'm feeding my brain. I'm feeding my, 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 my whole full system, Correct. fortifying it. Because, you know, if, if you look at just advertising and food, it's, you know, mm -hmm. feed your craving, you know, eat, eat pizza, eat a hamburger, sure, you know, sure. are you satisfied? And people eat to, for, for, for satisfaction and for pleasure. Yes. Um, but we don't, we don't think as much about, um, we might think a little bit about, a, you know, okay, that meal's balanced, that meal's healthy. But we may not know enough about nutrition we, to We know, don't know enough. Uh, yeah, to feed sure ourselves you. Our really physicians well. do not know enough about right. nutrition either. Uh, nor do our, uh, many of our health coaches. Sort of been discounted almost, you know. Well, it's been discounted. Uh, adding to that, the um, U.S., the FDA, is the one who's charged with creating the dietary guidelines. Uh, and they're also charged with promoting agricultural products. Mm. And so the committee, the U.S. Dietary Advice Committee, uh, is appointed by the FDA and the Health and Human Services. And if you track who's been appointed to those committees, you see that uh, with each committee, there's a higher percentage of people with direct financial ties to uh, the agriculture industry, uh, uh, beef industry, pork industry, dairy industry, uh, food processing, and even pharmaceuticals. So those conflicts of interest are eventually feeding into what we see as the food pyramid. Exactly. So the food pyramid is increasingly criticized for ignoring science. The science that says greens, vegetables, paleolithic eating uh, results in superior health outcomes. Instead, you can track as the agriculture industry became more and more uh, involved uh, with financial ties in the advisory committee that the amount of grain they were supposed to consume went to six to 11 servings. Uh, the amount of meat went up to six and a half ounces. The amount of dairy went up to three cups. Uh, and fruits and vegetables were, you know, five to nine. Uh, so that we're ignoring a lot of science in order to promote product. And uh, the U.S. Dietary Guidelines direct how billions of federal dollars are spent for women, infant, and children, food stamps, school lunch programs. And so the food industry spends millions and millions of dollars to influence placement of their products mm. in the dietary guidelines. Wow, and then at great risk to health. the health of great general risk population. To the health. Uh, another factor uh, are dopamine levels. Uh, pleasure goes up when we eat. The food industry uh, is able to recognize that by manipulating the salt, sugar, fat content, you can get a sharper rise in dopamine depending on how you arrange the salt, sugar, fat content. So a high carb meal with some fats in it. Most french of fries. our fast food, french fries, um, the coffee lattes with all of that, the whipped cream, sugar, honey in it, uh, big dopamine spike. No micronutrients, no vitamins, minerals, things that are essential to our health. Mm. So as a nation, we are addicted to food that is destroying our health. Hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it's sad. Uh, if we're eating paleolithically, our greens, our colors, our sulfur-rich vegetables, uh, and uh, some meat, we'd be eating food that would nourish our cells, perform the biology of life, the biochemistry of life properly, and would have a stunning level of health and recovery. Blood pressures would fall, blood sugars would improve, Angel pains resolve, mental health problems resolve. I see this time and time again in my practice. The other thing that I see is patients, when presented with um, the benefits of eating for health, eating greens, sulfur-rich vegetables, color, more often than not, we'll do that. And we'll make commitments towards eating nine cups of fruits and vegetables a day. Now, um what are some of the other incentives for eating well? I mean, are you going to see, you're going to see some improvements in, um, in, in brain function and okay. things like that. But so, you know, in my practice, um, I often start with go gluten and dairy free um, and do that for two weeks and just see what happens. Uh, if you find that you feel better um, or you aren't sure that you, you're feeling better or not, go gluten free, dairy free two weeks then give yourself a test gluten meal and see how it goes. If it kind of crashes you then. If you end up with severe headaches, migraines, a flare of your asthma, a flare of acne, it's like, okay, 
you are gluten sensitive. Now, depending on the individual, I may tell them, you have such serious health problems, I'd really suggest that you do the hunter-gatherer version, which is no grain, no dairy, no legumes, and do the nine cups of fruits and vegetables. Uh, and then we can test things out one by one. Uh, so it depends on how ill the person is mm -hmm. uh, and how open they are uh, into making these radical changes. What I'm impressed is uh, people are much more willing to go down the food path. Pro in part, I'm sure, because they realize I'm speaking from experience mm -hmm. as opposed to book knowledge. Uh, but when you teach people uh, that if you don't have the building blocks to do the biology of life, things begin to fall apart. And so what I'm trying to teach them how to do is to eat so they have the building blocks for the biology of their life to happen more properly. So uh, once that light bulb goes on, people are much more willing to like, well, okay, so how do we do that? And uh, start on a new chapter in their lives. Well, and the, the number one complaint that I've observed that people have about their health is I'm tired, I'm fatigued, I'm oh, tired, absolutely. I'm fatigued. Um, so before we got together, I started reading your book, Minding My Mitochondria, and I thought, yes. you know, I eat, I eat pretty well according to your plan, but I definitely don't get enough vegetables. I need to cut the grains. I, you know, I had, I had yeah. some adjustments to make, so I decided I was going to try it out and see how it affected me. Mm -hmm. And um, my energy level at, 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 you know, six and a half months pregnant skyrocketed. Isn't that exciting? Just as I'm supposed to be kind of going into that third trimester and feeling exhausted. So I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. And um, I, I felt as though um, some of the, the fog that comes with pregnancy sometimes uh, kind of was lifted as well. And I thought, yes. wow, this is great. And then one day, and I, I was in a big hurry, and I grabbed a hoagie sandwich from a place downtown, you know, meat and cheese and bread, and, and I yeah. ate it, and I drank a Coke with it, and I felt awful, just yes. terrible for three days. It's very telling. Felt terrible. And yeah. I thought, wow, because I've had this experience now, I, I can try to, uh, I could have tried to say, oh, I think this sounds like a great idea that Terry's had, yeah. but when I experience it myself, I feel like I'm much more uh, convincing yes. Yes, to absolutely. be able to say to people, you know, you might want to. You might want to try this. You know. Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's very yeah. striking. Yeah, and and working with your um, the medical students that you're working with in your in your clinical trials, having them experience experience that. it, they much they're much more convincing with your patients. Now, I lecture the medical students as well. I have a couple lectures that I give them uh, about the patient experience and about nutrition. It's my goal. I'm not there yet, but I'd like to be able to teach uh, Paleolithic uh, diets uh, to the medical students, have them experience uh, what it's like to eat for health, have them experience detoxification, have them experience learning meditative practices, so that when they are trying to help their patients make these changes, they're speaking A, from experience, and you know, medical school, school and residency is very stressful. Uh, if we could help the students acquire these skills, it would get them through medical school more effectively through residency more effectively, and then they'd be far more effective with their uh, patients in the future. Wow. We'll see. Uh, you know, that's my goal. We'll see if I can uh, get that to happen or not. Wow. So um, this clinical study, this clinical yes. trial that, yes. you, that, yes. you, that you've been conducting, it's, um, it's kind of, is it rounding the corner here to, towards the so, end? So, no, we're, we're still uh, relatively early on. Um, uh, the clinical trial uses the same interventions that I used uh, for my treatment plan. So we have the neuromuscular stimulation, we have a progressive exercise program, we have uh, intensive nutrition, uh, and we have uh, the list of vitamins and supplements that I was using. Um, I have approval to have 10 people with secondary progressive. I've got, in fact, I enroll my seventh one tomorrow. Uh, and then we follow them every three months with measures of their thinking, their mood, their balance, their ability, ability to walk. Uh, and uh, we call them weekly. Uh, we give them a very complicated set of daily logs to fill out to keep track of everything they're eating, all the exercises they're doing, uh, how much time they're spending meditating, uh, self-massage. Uh, and uh, what, I, what I'm seeing is uh, fatigue scores are improving. Uh, the subjective report of mental fog uh, is also improving. 
Uh, and at the end of January, we'll do our first uh, set of formal re-measurements so I'll know, you know how much improvement did we get. Now keep in mind, I didn't see gait changes really until my fourth month. Um, but subject three, a music teacher uh, from uh, Illinois who had taught elementary school, had a very soft voice, uh, came in uh, at her two-month visit and sang us a song, a little Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer <laughs> song. It was just wonderful because uh, her voice was, was so much better. Um, so I'm excited. You know, people are, their skin's looking better. They're far more energetic. I'm expecting that we'll see uh, improvements in their uh, uh, processing speed for their thinking and probably in their walking speed and balance. Wow, and you've given people a really practical application in this book and minding my mitochondria. Yes, you know, yes. you're not saying, okay, here, pick up this piece of kale and just chomp it, though, you know, we, we can do that. Yeah, um, yeah. But you've, you've created recipes that people can um, really, I mean, the food's really enjoyable. It's really delicious. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the recipes that I used were things that uh, my family ate, uh, including my two teenagers, uh, and they're willing to eat and uh, enjoy. Um, because I, it's helpful to put out the theory of why you want to uh, eat this way, why you want to increase uh, your greens and your sulfur vegetables. But people benefit by having recipes to try, things to try to make it easier um, to serve, start, and get used to these uh, new concepts. Right, and kale is kind of one of the key, one of the key ingredients oh, yes, to, yes, to a yes, lot of. Yes, and yes. I think sometimes people look at kale, and they they it just seems like this just really tough, foreign right. um, object. And you have all these great ways of, of treating it and making it much more appealing. And um, I have a kale salad that I like to make for people yes, that yes. Um, I don't tell them what it is. I just sort of put it out there and let them, you know, at a potluck or something. Yeah, and, yeah. and everyone loves it. And I'm going to always ask for the recipe. And when I tell them that it's a raw kale salad, like what? They say, I don't like kale. And I said, well, you just had two helpings of it. So yeah, maybe you yeah. do. So, so the, eating the Walls diet, eating healthy, can be pleasurable. Oh, absolutely. It's, yeah. it's, it's wonderful food. It's, it's great food. Um, my uh, daughter, she does the kale salads, but her current uh, favorite is kale chips. Mm -hmm. uh, so I uh, put those, uh, you can either do them in the oven or in the dehydrator. And uh, so I usually send two bags uh, to school with Seb, one that she has, another one that she's been sharing with her friends. I've taught her friends how to make the kale chips. God, they're fabulous, just uh -huh. fabulous. I think that's a great testimony there, getting yeah. teenagers to eat kale chips. Right yes. there, that's. Yes. <laughs> well, it says a lot. You know, they like to have that's crunchy, one of the triumphs. Uh, <laughs> crunchy things. They like things to, to be tasty. And so I, I try to have uh, kale chips on hand all the time for her now. Works out very well. So, I think we're kind of winded down here, but I but I have to ask you. You know, here you're sitting. You're obviously really inspired. Yes. Yes. By the by the progress, by by your health, by um, how the people in your clinical trial, how their compliance is directly related to their improvement. Yes. 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 So, I mean, congratulations, and and, and what does but the future hold for you? Well, we're um, more wonderful things. Uh, my, I'm working on the next grant to do a uh, uh, larger study that will look at each of my interventions singly uh, for six months and we'll combine them all so I can show that yes, uh, e-STEM alone will help, yes, exercise alone will help, yes, nutrition alone will help, but it's putting them all together mm. that you get this magical, dramatic level of recovery. So more clinical trials, very important. If this message is gonna reach the public, I need to have clinical trials, published data uh, to achieve that. Uh, I've also uh, I've written uh, my memoirs, Up from the Wheelchair, which describe uh, my uh, family and my response to my illness, my decline, uh, my review of the medical literature, uh, discovery and creation of this intervention, which has uh, restored my life. Uh, so I'm working on the revisions, I'm working with my literary agent. I'm very hopeful we'll get that sold and get uh, that out uh, in the publishing uh, world soon. And I am continuing to give lectures uh, here regionally uh, and nationally, teaching the message that how we restore our health is through food, intensive nutrition, 
aimed at improving and maximizing the health of our mitochondria, the health of our cells, the health of our brains. Wonderful. Yeah, it's very exciting, very, very exciting. Well, Terry, thank you so much for sitting down with me and telling your mm -hmm. extraordinary story. You're welcome. Best of luck. Thank you. No.